West of Good Neighbor, and east of the Charles Amphitheater, lies a ruined skyscraper called the vault Regional Headquarters. This skyscraper is among many in a cluster towards the heart of downtown Boston. It is a rather unassuming building from the outside, and there is very little that designates it as a vault Headquarters. No signs, no logos, nothing of the sort. Perhaps at this point, vault was still mostly flying under the radar, not widely known by most of the general public, selling only to those whom they think would be good candidates. But then again, they do have an entire exhibit at Nuka World, so I'm not sure. Anyway, we must remember that this is a regional headquarters. We can't expect too much from this location. It's not like it's the world headquarters or global headquarters for the entire vault Corporation. No, this is a regional office. This is where vault conducts a lot of the business that needs to take place in the Boston area. So a lot of the vaults in this area were probably administered by this regional headquarters. Upon entry, we come into the reception area and we find an elevator that leads down to the basement. But let's explore the upstairs portion first. The bulk of this above ground tower is inhabited by a few ghouls and that's about it. The floors and ceilings have partially collapsed on each floor, creating handy ramps that snake upwards through the tower. There are three terminals in this building that provide us with a little bit of the backstory of what went on here. On the second floor is the first terminal, Martin Reed's Terminal. And this terminal is the source of one of the biggest lore arguments in Fallout 4. The first entry on September 29th, 2077, says that vault Tech shipped 15 cases of Psycho and Jet to Vault 95. Martin Reed disapproves of this because he knows that Vault 95 is supposed to help people get off of chems. Another vault Tech employee, Davidson, who appears to be one of the managers of this tower, told Martin that it was important to force the inhabitants to make hard choices. Martin Reed rightly says that he thinks it's really to cause a bloodbath. And we know from exploring Vault 95 in the video that I did on that vault, that that's exactly what happened. vault actually planted one of their agents inside Vault 95. That agent pretended to be a vault dweller for five years. After five years, that agent unlocked a hidden compartment in Vault 95 that stored all of this psycho and jet that is mentioned in this terminal. Now, the reason this may be lore-breaking is because we all remember from Fallout 2 that a boy genius, Myron, is responsible for inventing jet. Now, this could be lore-breaking for you, or you could try to find a way to explain it away. I like to explain it away like this. Psycho and Jet were readily available before the war. After the war, the manufacturers of these chems stopped producing them, and all the world was left with was the supply that existed before the bombs dropped. Enter Fallout 2, and Myron finds some Jet and reverse engineers it so that he can recreate it. He then tells everybody that he is the true inventor of Jet, and who's to say that he's a liar? He's producing brand new pieces of Jet that didn't exist beforehand. We know that chems are readily produced. Even in Fallout 4, there is the Morowski's Chem Lab found in the Four Leaf Fish Packing Plant, where they produce chems like both Jet and Psycho. Anyway, this one is certainly up for debate. You can either decide that it is lore-breaking for you or find some way to excuse it. This terminal also tells us a little bit about Vault 111. Martin says that one of his co-workers Walter Scott found a huge shipment marked for Vault 111 and it said, do not open. But Walter, ever curious, opened it anyway and what did he find inside? Hundreds of gallons of liquid nitrogen. What could they possibly need that for, opined Martin. Of course, we know that Vault 111, your vault, had all of the cryopods and the cryolator. Apparently, we can gather from this that vault used actual liquid nitrogen as part of the freezing process. Now, in the real world, if you froze something with liquid nitrogen, you would kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, you freeze something with liquid nitrogen, that can destroy the cell structure, which ends the life of the organism. So I'm not sure exactly what vault Tech did to the liquid nitrogen to make it so that it didn't destroy cells, but apparently whatever they did, it worked. The final entry from Martin Reed is an angry one. He says, that's it. I can't work under a manager who's so oblivious to what's going on around him. Martin Reed is convinced that vault Tech is doing a bunch of evil experiments on the inhabitants of their vault. Of course, we know 200 years later that Martin is absolutely correct. But apparently this is a secret that vault Tech Corporation hid from some of their lower level managers and employees. 
It's only through uncovering secrets of vault Tech that Martin discovered what they were really doing. Many of the other employees were completely blind to it and didn't want to notice the truth. Davidson still doesn't see it, says Martin, or he's just ignoring it. Martin puts in his two weeks and walks away from the company. On the third floor, we find a pool table falling down into a partially collapsed portion of the floor. This allows billiard balls to cascade down amongst the floors below. We also find Frank Davidson's terminal. This is the Davidson that Martin said was clueless or willfully ignorant. And we learn from his terminal that he is. He says, I believe Mark is under the impression that the vaults in Boston will be used to harm its residents. He says, vault Tech would never do anything like that. He's being paranoid. Yeah. We also learned that this guy has a bit of a temper. In his next entry, he says, Sharon spilled coffee on my new shirt while we were in the lounge this morning. We all had a laugh about it. Ha ha ha. If she does it again, I'll stab her in the throat with my pen. She's a good kid. Okay there, Davidson. Somebody needs some anger therapy. The final entry is Frank Davidson complaining about Martin. It's also vaguely threatening. He says, Martin is beginning to get on my nerves. All he does is come up with all these conspiracy theories about how vault Tech is really harming its residents. If he doesn't stop, I might have to discipline him. Clearly, Davidson has some issues. He seems to get angry and annoyed quickly, and he's violent. Now, this third floor is the highest floor in the tower. To explore the rest of the facility, we need to go all the way back down and take the elevator to the sublevel. This is the warehouse level where packages came into the headquarters and were then diverted to the appropriate vaults. This is where Martin found the Psycho and the Jet that was destined for Vault 95, and where Walter Scott found the liquid nitrogen destined for Vault 111. The third and final terminal is on this floor and it belonged to Walter Scott. In the first entry, he expresses concern over the fate of Martin Reed. He says, Mr. Davidson has been getting annoyed with Martin lately. Scott says, I told Martin he should probably back off a bit because I know Mr. Davidson has a temper. I saw him break a pull cue over Roger's head because he stood too close to the table when Mr. Davidson was taking his shot. Roger still has trouble with hearing in his right ear. Not only is Frank threatening violence on his terminal, but he has become violent with some of his underlings in the office. The final entry is the most harrowing. He says, I miss Sharon. She's been out for a couple of days and it's just not the same here without her. No one upstairs has heard from Sharon. I'm starting to worry. Getting to see her face when I go upstairs for lunch is the highlight of my day. Remember, Sharon is the employee that Mr. Davidson threatened to kill with an ink pen through the throat if she spilled coffee on him again. The sad part is that you find a skeleton in a vault tech lab coat stuffed behind some of the crates in the warehouse, and right next to her is a blue ink pen. This cannot be coincidental. Sharon must have accidentally spilled coffee on Frank Davidson again, and he responded by shoving an ink pen into her throat until she died. And then he hid her body in the warehouse behind some crates. She was gone for many days. No one knew anything about it. And the only person who missed her was someone who secretly admired her from afar. Poor Walter Scott in the sublevel warehouse who looked forward to seeing her face at lunchtime every day. Little did he know that her corpse was rotting mere feet away from his desk. Using his terminal, you can unlock the exit door, which brings you back outside. What's interesting about this tower is that the interior floors do not match the exterior. The basement warehouse door brings you out onto the level ground where you entered. If you go back around to the other side of the building, you're not going uphill. It's not like you're climbing another floor because there's an incline. No, it's flat and you go around to the other side and you find the door that leads you to the reception office, which is one floor above the basement. So there appears to be a little bit of a mistake here. The reception door and the warehouse door are on the same floor outside, but are on two different floors inside. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the vault Tech Regional HQ. It's not a place filled with tons of loot, bobbleheads, magazines, or cash. It doesn't play a central role in any quest, nor does it give us a lot of juicy details about vault Tech Corporation. But instead, it offers us a snapshot into the lives of normal, everyday individuals living and working out of this tower in downtown Boston before the bombs dropped.
What did you guys think of the vault Tech Regional Headquarters? Have you found it yet? This is one of the many skyscraper needles in that huge haystack in downtown Boston. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. If you'd like to discuss this topic with other like-minded individuals on my Oxhorn Community Discord server, be sure to check out the invitation link in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video today. Thank you for watching from the bottom of my heart, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early as always, with another video.